Um, and what we're talking about is unlocking that potential uh, to enable you to communicate, uh, like I said, thousands, perhaps millions of times faster than is, is currently possible. This is an incredibly profound breakthrough. Uh, this, would, this would be a fundamental change to what it means to be a human. It sounds like science fiction, but on September 19th, the headlines told a different story. Neuralink announced it will begin human trials in October. Trials designed to help people with speech impairments translate their thoughts directly into text. For the first time, the silent language of the brain may be given a voice. And if that's true, the implications stretch far beyond medicine. We'll hear it in his own words, so stay tuned. And don't forget to subscribe and like to follow the story as it unfolds. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Neuralink uh, presentation. This is an update for uh, the progress of the Neuralink team. It's been an incredible amount of progress. This is, um, we're going to start off high level, uh, generally describing what uh, Neuralink's doing. And then we're going to get have a very deep technical dive. So you can actually get an understanding of what exactly we're doing at a granular level and what we can do to enhance human capabilities and ultimately build a great future for humanity. So that's a, that's a neuron firing. It's funny to think that me talking right now is a bunch of neurons firing that then result in speech that you hear and cause neurons to fire in your brain. Um, yeah, a part, of, uh, part of this presentation is about demystifying the, the brain. Um, it is a remarkable organ. I mean, we are the brain, basically. When you say you, that really is, uh, you're the brain. Like, you can, you can get a, a heart transplant, you can get a kidney transplant, but I don't know anyone who's gotten a brain transplant. So, you are your brain. If the brain is the human, then altering the brain means altering humanity itself. This isn't just medicine, it's the power to rewrite what it means to be a person. And Elon Musk has already begun to frame it in those terms. And your experiences are these neurons firing uh, with uh, trillions of, of synapses. Um, that somehow lead to conscious comprehension of the world. Uh, this is something that we have only begun to understand. We're really just barely at the beginning of understanding of what is the nature of consciousness. Um, and I've thought a lot about what, what is consciousness? What is it, where does consciousness arise? Because um, if you start at the beginning of the universe, assuming physics is true, the phys current, the standard model of physics is true, then you have this uh, Big Bang, you know, the matter con condensing into stars, those stars exploding. Uh, a lot of the, the atoms that are in your body right now were once at the center of stars. Those stars exploded, recondensed. Um, fast forward 13.8 billion years and here we are. And somewhere along that very long journey, to us at least, uh, consciousness arose, or the, uh, the molecules started talking to each other. And uh, it begs the question of what is consciousness? Is, is everything conscious? Maybe. It's hard to say where along that line that there's no sort of discrete point where consciousness didn't exist and then suddenly does exist. It seems to be maybe you have a condensation of matter that has a a density of con like we don't know what the real, the real answer is we don't know what consciousness is. Um, but with uh, Neuralink and uh, the progress that the company's making, we'll begin to understand a lot more about consciousness. Um, and what does it mean to, to be? But here's the question. Should we? We are reaching into mysteries we barely comprehend. Consciousness, identity, 
the spark of awareness itself. Is it wisdom or hubris? Because history tells us that when science races ahead of understanding, the line between breakthrough and nightmare blurs. Isn't this how every science fiction horror begins? Um, along the way, we're, we're, we're going to solve a lot of um, a lot of brain issues uh, where the brains get uh, injured or damaged in some way or didn't develop in quite the right way. But there's, yeah, but there's, um, there's a lot of brain and spine injuries that will solve along the way. And I do want to emphasize that this is all going to happen quite slowly, meaning you'll, you'll see it coming. Sometimes people think that uh, suddenly there will be vast numbers of neural links all over the place. This, this is not going to be sudden. You'll be able to watch it happen, you know, over the course of several years. Um, and, um, and we go through exhaustive regulatory approvals. Uh, so this is not something that we're just doing you know, by ourselves without uh, government oversight. We're, uh, we work closely with the regulators every step of the way. We're very cautious with, uh, with the neural links in humans. Uh, that's the reason we're not moving faster than we are, is because we're, we're taking great care with, with each individual uh, to make sure we, we never miss. And so far we haven't, and I hope that continues into the future. Every single one of our implants in humans uh, is working and working quite well. Um, and you'll get to hear from some of the people that uh, have received the implants and uh, hear it in their words. Along the way, that's how Elon Musk describes opening the human skull, inserting a chip, and altering the most complex organ in existence. Spoken lightly, as if it were just another engineering milestone. But what is the real goal here? To heal the injured or to re-engineer the human mind itself? Because once you begin tampering with the brain, you're not just fixing problems, you're rewriting what it means to be human. So what we're, we're, we're creating here with a Neuralink device is a generalized input-output uh, technology for the brain. So uh, it's how do you get information into or out of the brain um, and do so in a way that does not damage the brain or you know, cause any negative side effects. Uh, so it's a very hard problem. And um, generally, the, the reactions I've seen to this uh, range from it's impossible to it's already been done before. Um, uh, those, those people should meet, actually. Um, uh, the reality is that there actually have been uh, limited brain-to-computer uh, interfaces for uh, several decades on a very basic basis. Uh, just what we're doing with Neuralink is dramatically increasing the bandwidth by um, many orders of magnitude. So you can, you can, it, uh, a human bandwidth out, output is less than one bit per second over the course of a day. So there's 86,400 seconds in a day. It's very rare for a person to do more than 86,400 bits of output per day. Uh, you'd have to be really talking a lot or typing all day, and you might exceed that. Um, so what we're talking about here is, is going from maybe one bit per second to ultimately megabits and then gigabits per second. Um, and the ability to do conceptual, uh, consensual telepathy. Um, now the, the input to the brain is much uh, higher, because of, especially because of vision. Um, depending upon how you count it, it, it might be on the order of uh, a megabit or in the megabit range for input primarily due to sight. Um, so, uh, but e even for input, we, we think that can be dramatically increased uh, to, to the gigabit plus level. Um, and, and a lot of the, the thinking that we do is we're, we're we take a concept in our mind and we compress that into a small number of symbols. So when you're trying to communicate to, with, with somebody else, uh, you're actually trying to model their mind state um, and, and, and then take perhaps a, a quite a complex idea that you have, maybe even a, a complex image or, or scene or kind of mental video, and try to compress that into a few words or a few keystrokes 
and it's necessarily going to be very lossy. Your ability to communicate is very limited by how fast you can talk and how fast you can type. Um, and what we're talking about is unlocking that potential uh, to enable you to communicate, uh, like I said, thousands, perhaps millions of times faster than is, is currently possible. This is an incredibly profound breakthrough. Uh, this, would, this would be a fundamental change to what it means to be a human. A fundamental change to what it means to be human. Not an upgrade, not a treatment, a rewriting of the very definition of us. And history shows that when we tamper with the essence of humanity, the outcome is never simple and never without a cost. So we're starting off with reducing uh, human suffering so or, or addressing uh, issues that people have, say if they've been in an accident or they have some uh, uh, neural disease that's degenerative, so they're losing uh, capability to move their body or uh, some, some kind of injury, essentially. Um, so enabling, the, our first product is called telepathy, and that enables someone who has uh, lost the ability to command their body to be able to communicate with a computer and move the mouse and, and actually operate a computer uh, with roughly the same dexterity, ultimately much more dexterity than a, than a human with uh, working hands. Um, then the, the, our next product is, is blind sight, which will enable those who have l total loss of vision, including if they've lost their eyes or the optic nerve, or maybe have never seen, or bl even blind from birth, to be able to see again. Uh, initially, low resolution, but ultimately very high resolution, and, and then in multiple wavelengths. So you could be like Jordi LaForge in Star Trek, and you can see in radar, you can see in infrared, ultraviolet, superhuman capabilities, um, cybernetic enhancement, essentially. Um, and then along the way, this should help us understand a lot more about consciousness. What does it mean to be a, a conscious creature? Um, we'll understand vastly more about the nature of consciousness as a result of this. And then ultimately, I think this helps mitigate the civilizational risk of artificial intelligence. And then, almost as a throwaway, he says it. Artificial intelligence. Not healing, not enhancement, but survival itself. The brain chip, he claims, is our shield against AI. But if the solution is this extreme, what kind of threat are we really facing? Um, we're, we are actually already, we already sort of have three layers of thinking. Um, there's the limbic system, which is your kind of your instincts, the, corti the, the your uh, cortical system, which is your higher level planning and thinking, and then the tertiary layer, which is uh, the computers and machines that you interact with, like your phone, your, all the applications you use. Um, so you, people actually are already a cyborg. You can maybe have an intuitive sense for this by how much you miss your phone if you leave it behind. Uh, leaving your phone behind is like, it's almost like missing limb syndrome. Uh, your phone is somewhat of an extension of yourself as is your computer. So you, um, you already have this digital tertiary layer, but the bandwidth between your cortex and your digital tertiary layer is limited by speech and by and by how fast you can move your fingers and how fast you can consume information visually. So, um, so it's, but I think it's actually very important for us to address that input-output bandwidth constraint in order for the collective will of humanity to match the will of artificial intelligence. Um, that's my intuition, at least. Already cyborgs. That's how Musk describes us. Phones as missing limbs, computers as extensions of the self. But then comes the warning. Unless we fuse more tightly with machines, the will of humanity may be outmatched by the will of artificial intelligence. A contest between man and machine, and the battlefield is the human brain. The trial has already begun. The question is no longer if Neuralink will change humanity, but what kind of humanity will be left when it does. Subscribe 
share, and stay with us. The story is only just beginning.